First, I want to say welcome to the first service for some of you who uh, are normally second service. A little more full. Yeah, hi, John. I wasn't calling you out, but you offered. Yeah. It, it won't last more than one week, probably, right? But it's good to have you. Well, this morning we are finally back in our First Corinthians sermon series that we paused in August. We started September, as we normally do, with three grace stories, testimonies of faith from our congregation. That fed right into our six-week vision campaign, and we're back to our normal meal, um, our normal meat and potatoes. We will finish 1 Corinthians over these four Sundays, and that'll run right into the season of Advent. Thankfully, after um, all this time, our passage this morning makes it easy to jump back into Paul's letter because he's about to start sharing his last words to the church at Corinth to emphasize matters of first importance. So it's a clean start, and if you're able to, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse one. If you don't have a Bible, especially as we go along, let me encourage you to grab one under the chairs in front of you. You can find it on page 933. Listen carefully. These are God's words. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. This is God's word, let's pray. Lord, we need to hear, perhaps for the first time, um, perhaps for the hundredth time, we need to hear these things that are of first importance. There is nothing more important to life and eternity than the gospel of Jesus Christ. So give us eyes to see and ears to hear as your spirit works in us. We ask in the name of the risen Savior and King, Jesus himself, amen. Please be seated. This chapter is known as the resurrection chapter, and I've used this morning's passage on Easter Sunday in years past, but this morning I'm gonna treat this a little bit differently especially because we will end up spending two more Sundays on chapter 15 talking about resurrection. So my usual three-point sermon will be very much front-loaded. So so here's my pastoral encouragement to you. When we're 20 minutes in and you realize we're still on point one, do not panic. It'll be okay. I will land the plane, all right? But it's gonna be front-loaded this morning. We'll start with this, and here's our outline. Remember... According to the scriptures, with gratitude. We'll start and, and focus on remember this morning. In the original manuscript that Paul wrote in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, the very first word in chapter 15 is the word that's translated in English, I want to remind. It's one word. I want to remind, word order in the Greek as as in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, word order communicates emphasis. What you put first is what's most important. I want to remind. And before we unpack Paul's message, think about everyday examples of why we need reminding. 
maybe I am getting old, maybe life is more complex these days, but this past week I looked at my phone and I counted 13 different alarms that I typically use. Some of them I reuse and I just change the day and the time for whatever's going on. And you, maybe you're thinking like, I'm ADD, I do 13 in one hour, that's nothing. But we need reminding of what has to happen next. Um, when I'm grilling, on our back deck, I tell my watch to set a timer for two minutes as I run in to multitask so I don't forget the meat and overcook it. I put to-dos in my calendar, one in particular, three Saturdays from now to take out the frozen turkey and put it in the fridge to thaw so that it'll be ready for prep on Wednesday and I can't forget these things. Actively remembering is a little bit different than getting reminders. Uh, as a new Christian in college, I learned from other students the discipline of scripture memory. And I ended up with two plastic boxes with index cards, each of which had a different scripture passage written out with the reference at the top and the text on, on the lines. I, I knew I could memorize a couple of verses for the Wednesday night Bible study and recite them, but if I didn't actively remember by going through these index cards, it would come in one ear and out the other. I would forget it, guaranteed. Family stories are a, a way of actively remembering. They explain how two different families join together to form your particular life and your life story. Family stories explain Cedar's Italy roots and family stories explain my China roots, and, and those roots explain why our fridge, cabinets, and pantry are all filled with spices and sauces and condiments and ingredients, uh, all of which have ever been known to mankind. Um, but these stories also explain how earlier generations faced struggle in their native lands and ended up here. History through stories, explain the present in a vivid way. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is telling the family story of the family of God, of people of faith. Not their physical descendancy, but their spiritual lineage going back. But he only highlights in our verses the most recent, the most climactic, the, the defining elements of this story, capital S, that God has been telling throughout all of history. There are chapters to this story of salvation that go way back, and one theme in the Old Testament, the earlier chapters of this story, one theme is that the people of God consistently fail to remember. So in Exodus, it, the book starts with the, the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. And in uh, around chapter seven, God begins to redeem the Israelites from their 400 plus years of slavery through a display of supernatural power. He brings 10 plagues on the Egyptians, the last of which is the Passover event that breaks the will of Pharaoh. Let my people go, he finally does. They move out, the Egyptian army pursues the Israelites, but then the miraculous parting of the Red Sea takes care of that Egyptian army once and for all, and the people go into the desert, where manna, bread from heaven, and water gushing from a rock supernaturally sustain these million-plus pilgrims as they travel through the desert. That's all in Exodus chapter 7 through 15 action-packed demonstrations of God's supernatural powers. But in the very next scene, in chapter 16, the Israelites start grumbling and complaining right away. Why? It's not possible that they just forgot what God had just done. They had seen it with their own eyes. They couldn't explain it through natural means. He had done these things. Their problem was that they already were failing to actively remember. And what came to their minds was incredibly distorted. They whine, in Egypt we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. And you wanna say, really? 
Your slave quarters were an all-inclusive resort. You, you had everything you wanted. Memories got already distorted. They, they remembered wrongly. If you don't actively remember, you will forget, or you'll remember wrongly, or even worse, you'll be convinced that falsehood and deception are actually true. So Paul's first thought here is, remember the gospel. Verse one, which you received and on which you have taken your stand, both in the past tense. He goes on, verse two, by this gospel, Paul literally writes this, you are being saved. It's a present, ongoing tense. So salvation, we're not gonna go too deep into this, but salvation has a point in time element in your past, justification. And salvation has an ongoing, not ever completed until Jesus comes back aspect, which is sanctification. So connecting the past to your present and future by remembering is critical to any life of faith. It's critical. Verse two, though, adds one more detail. And if, there's a condition. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. That's tough. We can say this confidently though. Paul is not saying that your salvation depends on you hanging on tightly enough, long enough. We know Paul's not saying that if you let go, God will let go of you. How can we know these things? because other scripture passages tell us very clearly that true believers in Jesus cannot lose your salvation. Jesus said this in John chapter six, verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, speaking of the Father, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me but raise them up at the last day. He will hang on to his people until he comes again, until history ends and time runs into eternity. And then John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus said this, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So what does Paul's condition, if you hold firmly, what does it mean? Well, staying in John's gospel, in John chapter eight, we read that as Jesus is teaching, many believed in him. That's a good thing. We're glad to read that. Here's the next verse, verse 31. Uh, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold, if, Oh, another condition. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The next section, immediately following, it's the same scene, Jesus in this, in this crowd, there's a verbal clash between Jesus and these people. There's an argumentation that goes back and forth. And Jesus ends up saying in verse 45, Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Wait a second. Jesus is teaching. Many believe in him. And then he says, if you believe, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then same scene, verse 45, he says, because I tell you the truth, because I'm shooting straight with you, because you don't like what you're hearing, you do not believe me. So, and then they accuse him of being demon possessed (laughs) on top of it all, which makes it clear uh, that they're rejecting Jesus. So, did they lose their salvation in a matter of about five, 10 minutes? They believed, the text said. But then if you believe, and then Jesus says you do not believe, and their response proves it, did they lose their salvation? Hardly, likely, at all. What makes far more sense is that their belief was an indicator that they seemed like they were saying the right things, responding positively. Maybe they were coming to admire Jesus' understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. They were absolutely struck that he spoke as one with authority. Uh, they, maybe they were nodding their heads at some point in his teaching, liking what they heard. But in today's world, we might say, the people gladly came to church 
they were actively singing the worship songs. They, they were hanging out in the fellowship hall, actually considering one of the adult Sunday school classes and coming back. But what happens that leads some to, quote, believe in vain, verse two of our passage this morning, at the end of the day? Whether it's five or 10 minutes or five years of pretty regular church attendance. In the parable of the soils, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says that in some people, the enemy, the devil, snatches away the seed of the gospel that's sown in their hearts, S-O-W-N, right? There's something that germinates in this illustration of the parable of the soils, right? The sower is casting out seed and, and something sprouts. There's life, you would say. Um, but for others, trouble and persecution call them to quickly fall away. It's rocky soil. They can't put down roots. For others, worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it cannot produce fruit. Those first three soils are not believers in Jesus. But seed that falls on good soil always produces an incredibly abundant, fruitful crop. Those, those are the believers. So, 1 Corinthians 15, verse two. If you believe in vain, you've received God's word in some external sense. You've responded, you've, you've nodded your head, you've shown up, you, you've participated with the community of faith, but challenges in life or even something positive, desirable, like wealth, financial flourishing, something exposes that belief as insincere, as lacking full understanding of the gospel. Your, maybe your faith is revealed as only a transactional relationship. What I mean by that is you believed while you were getting something in return, while it was worth your while, but when it's not what you expect, you turn away. God did not deliver. Only true saving faith unites you to Christ in a bond that cannot be broken because he will not let you go. There is never a moment in the Christian life as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, when it's not imperative, absolutely necessary, life-sustaining, to actively remember the heart of the gospel. How do you do that? You, you read scripture, you meditate on it, you pray through it, you apply scripture to yourself. It's not just head knowledge to acquire like you're reading some uh, textbook about God. You are, you are engaged in this relationship with the living God and he is speaking to you through his word. That's how you active remember the heart of the gospel. And what is a, 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 the, the matter of first importance, Paul's emphasis of the end of the story, the climax of the story, the most relevant things about the story that God's been telling throughout all of history, what is of first importance is to take scripture and apply it to yourself along these ways. I am a sinner without hope except by the mercy of God who gave his own son, Jesus, to take my place, to uh, serve the sentence of death that my sins deserve and then to rise in victory over sin and death and to promise me that same inheritance on the last day. Those are the matters of first importance. Failing to remember is a choice to forget, or worse, to remember wrongly, or worst of all, to accept what's false and deceptive as true and authoritative. That was true in first century Corinth and it's still true in 21st century North Jersey. That will happen unless each of us individually and then together on a Sunday morning, actively remembers the truth of the gospel. Secondly, we remember a 
according to the scriptures. Paul starts verse three, verse three with an, an important little detail. For what I received, I passed on to you. He, this isn't something he came up with. Human wisdom did not figure out the mysteries of the universe. No, he's emphasizing from the, from the first year, God revealed truth to him. It came from above. This, this tells us something important about the role of preaching in a worship service. If there's any sense in which I end up being helpful to you, if there's any sense in which I have a fruitful pastoral ministry, if there's any sense of, in which I am faithful to God, it's because I am passing on to you what I've received, and you've received it as well. And so uh, I'm reminding you on a Sunday morning of the truth of God's word that you have access to as well. I, there, there's no secret sauce. There's no um, side room revelation, right? And, and you're dying to know, what did God say to you? No, no, that, that was Moses in the Old Testament. That was an incredibly unique relationship. Moses would meet with God in the tent of meeting. He'd come back glowing because he'd hung out with God. There, there's none of that anymore, right? We have access to these matters of first importance, and my role this morning and every Sunday is to help you focus on what is most important. It's right here. Which is the very next thing Paul says in verse three. The most important things are according to the scriptures. Which is the only way to avoid wrong memories, wrong thinking, distortions of truth. We all, we're all gonna remember wrong. That happens, and we argue about it, and it causes conflict. How do we not remember wrong about what God has done, according to the scriptures? So verses three and four, here it is, the gospel. Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised. These are the matters of first importance. Some of you are here this morning, and perhaps on a regular basis, because you have a, a spiritual curiosity. You're open to the things of spiritual, the spiritual world. And by the way, I, uh, Cedar mentioned this to me this morning, apparently the new thing is for mid-career professionals to quit their jobs and go to Harvard Divinity School. It's like, what cool thing am I supposed to be doing? <gasps> I, I gotta quit my job and, and apply to Harvard Divinity School. Let me tell you, I, quite frankly, you're not gonna find Jesus at Harvard Divinity School. There are no matters of first importance left at a place that was um, instrumental in the work of God in New England in centuries past because they're not according to the scriptures. But maybe, maybe there's, there's a spiritual curiosity in you and you wanna know God. You wanna experience something of the divine. Here's what we would say as a community here at Grace Redeemer Church the starting and ending point for any real interest in God are these truths about God the Son, Jesus born in Bethlehem, executed outside of Jerusalem on a Roman cross. He died on behalf of sinners. He was buried, which emphasizes the depths of his humility, that the God-man, divine and human, he spent three days under the power of death for us, but God, those are gospel words. The Father raised the Son on the third day, all according to the scriptures, all fulfilling God's plan, none of which was a surprise. Paul knows from his life and ministry how often people sneered at that last truth. No one walks out of the of a tomb on the third day. No one beats death. It'll come for all of us. And so what he adds, which is also of first importance, are the details in verses five through eight. This resurrected Jesus appeared to the apostles and then to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. Very key uh, detail. That many people cannot share the same hallucination. It's not possible. That many people can conspire together to make up a story, but 
someone would surely crack under the pressure of persecution and give up the lie, especially because many would actually, historically proven, go to their deaths defending their faith. It's not possible that 512 plus people all suffer intense persecution, maintaining some illusion for the sake of a story. They faced, in reality, the worst with courage, with boldness, because they knew that their Lord and Savior and King Jesus had defeated death through resurrection. He had conquered their worst enemy, which is death. And so, kind of a, you know, do to me whatever you will because resurrection will undo it. I'm not afraid of you. What kind of faith is that that we would love to have? Unaffected by what the world might throw at us. That's my question. Do you believe that this morning? That resurrection can make all things new. It's not just a nice idea. It's not just a Sunday school answer that you can nod your head until adversity hits. Do you believe this? Do you actively remember the heart of the gospel to connect the past of God's salvation work, what he has done, to your present and your future so that you can face with courage and boldness whatever the world may throw at you. If you are a follower of Jesus, whatever comes your way, even death itself, resurrection will undo it. If you're not a believer in Jesus and you're here among us this morning, our, our main message to you is to look to Jesus. The circumstances of life are not going to simply work out in your favor. Odds are against that. And, and God is not God simply because everything happens to work out for you and no matter, no, no worries about everyone else. That, that, that's no um, logical construct of the creator of the universe who has all wisdom and works all things for his greatest good throughout all of time with eternity as the backdrop. These matters of first importance lead to this kind of question. How does your life fit into the story that God has been telling throughout history? In particular, the matters of first importance that have to do with Jesus, God the Son. The question is not, how is God playing his role in your story? That never works out because God usually doesn't do what you think he's supposed to do uh, for your greatest happiness in your times, in your time, time frame, the way you would want him to. Your story with you as the author and director cannot end well because of your sin. Only God's story bursts with new life through the rising from the dead of Jesus. So remember the gospel according to the scriptures with gratitude. Lastly and most briefly, when Paul mentions that Jesus appeared to all the apostles, that's not the 12, those are the other sort of um, new circle of disciples that followed who would carry on this message. And he says in verse eight, last of all, Jesus appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul had a, a scary, cringeworthy, sinful life in his past. He had been arresting and putting to death followers of Jesus thinking that he was doing the right thing. Uh, and, and he was completely headed in the wrong direction. He knew, Paul knew that his sin cost Jesus not only his life, but the eternal fellowship that Jesus had experienced and enjoyed with the Father from all eternity past. How long that lasted, we don't know, but it happened on the cross. And so, on this side of salvation, Paul overflowed with gratitude. He never forgot where he should have been, but God had rescued him in mercy and chosen to use Paul as his instrument of life. And so the least Paul could do 
was to serve his king and savior with everything that he had without concern when it would cost Paul his life, which it did. Most of us think of ourselves as pretty good. But whatever measure of I'm not that bad, you tend to think it can hold you back. It can make you a little bit proud. It can cause you to neglect gratitude towards God. You and I don't deserve his favor. Paul knew that, that was his greatest asset. But that's why remember the gospel is what has first importance to Paul. Christ died for our sins, verse three. As Peter puts it, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Don't ever forget that the reason resurrection glory exists in the first place is because our sin brings death and God was gracious and merciful to address our greatest enemy. But God, there are no dead ends because resurrection power makes all things new. This is the gospel according to 1 Corinthians. Let's pray. Lord, we have so many ways of actively remembering what is most true. Show us everything that distracts, that we think we'd rather give attention to in entertainment, in recreation, in mind-numbing scrolling, Lord, when we'd actively fail to remember, we will forget and falsehood and deception will reign over our minds and hearts. Let that not happen, Lord. Be gracious to us. Expose what chokes faith, what causes it to shrivel and bear no fruit, what steals it away, Expose that all in us, Lord, that we might remember what has greatest importance according to the scriptures, and that we would actively remember Jesus and his perfect life and his substitute death and his victorious rising. Cause us to fix our eyes on Jesus, and that we would flourish, that you would be greatly honored. Amen. On Sunday, uh, Sunday services, we move from time in God's word to a time that we call renewal, trusting that God's word and his spirit shine a light into the dark crevices of our hearts and expose sin. What might you admit is true of your own life story, of your mindset, of your attitude, of your actions that fail to remember what is of first importance. What, what gets in the way? Perhaps it's the deceitfulness of wealth that chokes your faith. You're doing really well. Bergen County applauds you, but that very detail may actually be keeping you far from God. Whatever it is, take a, to- take a moment to pray to the Lord, silently and individually confess sin, and look to Jesus, the only Savior.